Hello, listeners. If you've enjoyed these narrations, please click on that like and subscribe button. I took in the morning. The fog so thoroughly obscured the landscape that I felt it was a new world. When you have lived somewhere for some time, you become accommodated to your environment. I had stopped seeing through the eyes of a newcomer. It was only on days of extreme weather that I could still feel the wonder. More than anything else, the trees took on an awesome dimension. Usually trees seemed to reach to the open sky, but this morning, in the thick fog, the trees appeared to hang in the air, reaching down to me. I wasn't the only one impressed by the shift in the environment, but Freddy didn't seem to like it so much. She needs at least two walks a day, even when the weather is unpleasant and extreme. She becomes restless otherwise. The barking can actually be quite painful. She protested a lot when I put her harness on, but she is a very good dog. She trusts me, and together we exit my front garden and step into the fog. Opposite my house, there is a large open field. It extended out into endless miles of countryside. Most farmers allow you on their land, providing you stick to the designated footpaths. If there is no path, they usually let you walk around the edges. The first field has a public footpath right through the middle. Often we find there are livestock, cows, sheep, in the field, so we usually stick to the path. At the end of the track, there are three stills. The one to the right takes us to our favorite fields. There are gates on all sides, and no animals. This means I can let Fred off of her lead and she can run around freely. She likes to have a good run in the morning. When we stepped onto the open field, we could see maybe 25 meters all around us. Anything beyond that receded into obscurity. This made me a little nervous because I couldn't tell if the cows were in the field or not. Freddy and I had a little incident a few weeks back. One of them seemed to think we were there to feed them. Mostly I like cows. They are naturally inquisitive and have sweet eyes. This cow in particular was very intrigued by us and pursued us relentlessly. Something about this seemed to spook the other cows and more appeared. I felt uncomfortable, but I continued to walk with Fred happily bouncing away next to me. The next time I turned my head to look, I saw to my very genuine horror all the cows in the field running downhill, charging at me and Fred. For those of you that don't live in the countryside, you should know that there are many deaths by trampling each year, often dog walkers. The thing you must do is let your dog run. They will be fine. They are much faster and nimbler than cows. It is you, the human, who is in danger. Fred and I were fortunate. We had been heading downhill and the cows struggled to maintain such high speeds at gradients like this. Their knees are not built for it at all. With this knowledge, I knew I had time to run to the bottom of the field and make it back to the entrance. Bless Fred. I don't think she had a clue. She was just happy to run. Not being able to see the cows in today's fog put me slightly on edge. But we made it to the still without an incident. At this end of the field, we could scarcely see 10 meters ahead. I wondered why Fred was so bothered by the fog. Dogs seem to use their noses and ears more than their eyes anyway. Crossing over into our favorite field, I left her off the lead. She seemed hesitant to leave my side. I sat down next to her. The grass was wet. I wanted to let her know it was alright. We sat there together for a while. When she was young, I taught her to give paw. To this day, when she needs my attention or is trying to make some kind of communication with me, she offers me her paw. She gave me her paw to hold in the field and leant with her head in resting spot between my elbow and forearm. I knew she was feeling uneasy, but I needed to get her a good run in before we went back home. It wouldn't do to have her barking all day, as she can. Sometimes she doesn't know what's best for her. I pick up a stick and coax her into playing a game of fetch. Gradually, I threw the stick further and further. Fred seemed less tense once I got her adrenaline going. She brought me back the stick and this time I really threw that thing. She shot off, bouncing from left to right in that funny way she does, bouncing until she's too engulfed by the fog. I couldn't see her, but I could hear her running around and panting a lot. I thought maybe she couldn't find the stick. She did seem to get agitated by something. I could hear her running in strange directions all around me. I called out to her. She was nowhere near where I had thrown the stick. I called out to her again. Her bark was very distant. She had gone too far and soon would be lost in the fog. I had been stupid. I got her all worked up, 
She had run off and now we were apart from each other. She couldn't see me. She probably couldn't even hear me either. The fog was dampening the sounds. Why did I encourage her to go run around like that? This was really stupid. And now I would have to wander around this murky landscape looking for her. It could take some time. I heard her again. She didn't bark this time. It wasn't a sound she made often at all. It was a clipped yelp. A pained cry. That something bad happened? It was far away. Somewhere in the first field, maybe. I called out to Fred. Told her I was coming and I ran. The fog was almost the only thing I could see. But I knew these fields very well. I thought she must have hurt herself somehow and that I needed to find her. My hands found the top of the still and I quickly clamped onto it. I almost slipped, but I caught myself in time. Panic was not going to help. I tried to steady my mind as well. She had left the other field. She had somehow came into this one. I heard her over there. What was it? I called again. No response. Freddy was fine. She had to be fine. I kept walking in the direction that I thought she was in. It was swampy and off the path. There had been large rainfall recently. The cows churned the field into mud. My feet were being sucked down, and it was getting harder to pull them out without the mud taking my shoes also. I was looking around trying to spot some dry ground where I saw the first one, a rotting cow. Flesh and bones somehow inverted, the rib cage set on top of the sinew, protecting it like an exoskeleton. The unprotected stomach, however, was being picked apart by crows. It was spilled out and mixed in the swampy water in the mud. In between the birds, I glimpsed the inside of the cow, filled with writhing and convoling larvae. I did not stop to have a good think about what was going on. I did not go up for a closer inspection. No, I just ran. I bolted. I left with such force, I pulled my left foot right out of its shoe, leaving it behind, stuck in the mud. As I ran through the field, I saw briefly three more cows in similar state. I took generous detours around them, and they disappeared into the gray void. I was lost. I had run in many strange directions since I saw the first poor cow. Fortunately, I had found solid ground to stand on. A moment to get my bearing. I turned to the right. There was nothing I could see that indicated where I was. I turned to my left and left out a cry of my own. There, looming towards me, was a bull. His eyes were open and misty. Patches of his hide had worn away, revealing the tender muscle structure of his head. Some of the sinews and muscles seemed to have fallen off. In these cavities, the white bone of his skull. His body had also undergo the disgusting inversion I had seen on the other dead cows. His guts and organs were swinging under his belly, and with every step he took, another little piece of visceral fell off into the mud. He was very alive. He lowered his head, maintaining eye contact as if he was going to charge. In that split second, I ran through my options in my mind. If this were any ordinary bull showing aggression, I would not have the advantage. The ground here was flat, wherever running speed I could gather, an ordinary bull would likely double, and in half the time. I suspected, however, that this twisted bull was a little incapable of doing that. I could try and run, but I didn't know where the near still was, and the ground was marshy in places, another advantage to the bull. I decided my best option was to make myself very large, to shout and scream in a way that might intimidate the creature. I put my arms up, overstretched, and made harsh, loud noises I hadn't known I was capable of making. The bull was unperturbed. It kicked a leg back in preparation for its charge. Perhaps I should have run in the first place. But I ran now, as fast as I could, trying to sidestep the monstrosity. I figured if it had to turn again and start its charge in another direction, that would buy me some more seconds, another one of my mistakes. The bull simply turned, jerking its head and body at me, a glancing blow, but it knocked me to the ground. I tried to drag myself away and made it into a soft, marshy ground, but it brought one of its front legs onto my right elbow, splattering me with muddy water and dirt shooting sharp pain up my right arm. I screamed. I could hardly see. The pain was blinding, and there was mud in my eyes. But I could make out well enough what was about to happen. The bull was rearing, ready to strike a final blow. I closed my eyes. What happened next, I can only make sense of now. At the time, I heard a terrible snarling, the sound of tearing flesh. And then I felt the full weight of the bull on my body and lost consciousness. 
I knew that some time had passed. For a while, I wasn't sure if I was even alive at all. Then I heard a steady breathing. I thought perhaps I was on the verge of death. Only I seemed to be getting more lucid. My thoughts less abstract. After a while, I even managed to separate what was me from what was external. The breathing was not my own. It was warm. It was over my head. And it was... Fred? I opened my eyes. She was over me, keeping watch, one paw on my head. I managed to say her name hoarsely, and she looked down. She licked me. Her tongue was soft. She had blood on her face. I wanted to get up to check if she was okay, but there was a weight on my body stopping me from moving. I bent my neck. There was the upper half of the bull lying across my torso and legs. It was very dead. Its throat had been ripped out, creating a cavernous space in its neck. The bull's eyes were open, unmoving. I wanted to be sick. Fred seemed pretty relaxed given the circumstances. She had a considerable amount of blood on her, as did I. I asked her if she was okay and she just pawed at me again. She was a good girl. I tried to slide out from under the bull. I couldn't put pressure on my right arm, so I pulled myself up with my left. I was in a bad way. Messed up arm, missing shoe, and covered in blood. The fog was receding, but I couldn't see the path. It hardly mattered anyway. Fred walked just in front of me. She knew the way home. The mist is still thick this evening. We have locked all the doors and windows. Fred has been given a double portion for a dinner, but unfortunately for her, I don't think we'll be going out for a walk tomorrow. Thank you for listening to another story from the Sanguinous Compendium. If you enjoyed, give that like and subscribe button a click, and ring that bell to hear more stories daily. <laughs>